Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Cyber Watch webinar series. Today's webinar, Losing the Privacy War, is being presented by Dr. Margaret Leary. Margaret has more than 35 years experience in IT and cybersecurity advising federal agencies on identity and privacy issues. In addition to numerous other certifications, she holds a Certified Information Privacy Professional for Government certification. She was appointed to the Internet of Things Subcommittee of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee, which made recommendations to the President of the United States on security issues and recommendations for the securing of the IoT, including identifying potential privacy issues associated with IoT. Additionally, she serves as the Edward Bursoff Endowed Chair for the Cybersecurity Program at Northern Virginia Community College and Director of Curriculum for the National Cyberwatch Center. Margaret, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Lewis. Can you see that? I can. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right, so thank you, and we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm gonna talk a, a couple of things. This is my soapbox that I like to, to think of it as, uh, uh, but in light of everything that's been going on with the Equifax breach, um, are, we really, are we really approaching this the right way? by considering personally identifiable information, at least the information that we are using, um, are we really doing the right thing in trying to protect this by protecting its confidentiality? Or is it entirely being used incorrectly to begin with? And, and that forms the basis of the real issue and, and enables uh, identity theft here. So we'll talk a little bit about Equifax. Um, and some of the issues in general with the use of personally identifiable information for um, uniquely identifying individuals and authenticating them to different services, and, and then also um, make some recommendations. So to begin with, with the Equifax uh, data breach here, um, a, a couple of, of things with the uh, Equifax timeline here. Um, March 29th to April 17th, um, you know, we saw that Equifax's uh, Krebs Security Online reported uh, that Equifax's uh, uh, application there that they sold for payroll uh, purposes here was only protected with a four-digit PIN. Uh, at the time, it wasn't deemed related to uh, the other breaches that came along later on here, but I, I think it sets the stage for uh, definitely how lax some of their security was, especially given the amounts of uh, sensitive information that they hold in their databases here. Mid-May uh, 2017 here, the attackers breached Equifax using a bug that was identified clear back uh, in March, uh, March 6th. Uh, July 29th, we saw that Equifax discovered the breach and, and stopped the intrusion, but August 1st and August 2nd, of uh, three of these top Equifax executives start selling off $2 million worth of stock, which is going to bite them uh, a little bit later. But uh, September 7th, um, Equifax disclosed a loss of 143 million consumer records and, and inadvertently directed folks to a fake phishing site. Uh, it was www.securityequifax2017 instead of being www.equifaxsecurity2017. Um, <clears throat> this breach uh, uh, revealed that uh, they'd lost names, social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and driver's license numbers, as well as uh, credit card data. Number uh, eight, they heard from Senator Warren, who chastised Equifax uh, uh, as they were, were getting folks um, to sign up for credit monitoring by, and pushing them into arbitration. Um, October 2nd, they released a review by Mandiant, who they contracted to look at, at how this had occurred. Um, and this increased the number that was affected up to 145.5 million, um, and also included not only U.S. databases, but about 8,000 Canadians. And of course, this was expanded then uh, October 24th to also include um, um, British citizens as well. So the technical details of the breach, uh, uh, the attackers came through uh, Apache 
a threat. It was a vulnerability that had been advertised, uh, a patch had been released uh, two months prior to this. Problem with the the uh, problem with the the update is that it, it required that the application would have to be completely recompiled, uh, and so it was a very labor-intensive patch for folks to install. But um, you know, generally these these critical patches of these critical natures tend to be um, uh, loaded a lot sooner than 10 months here. So they they had two months to patch uh, prior to exploitation and, and chose not to. Um, and and so, but the other thing that we saw again with that that previous breach here is that uh, in general they're using in general they were using very weak security practices anyway. In fact, uh, uh, on here you see that they were handling um, credit report disputes uh, in Argentina um, using admin admin credentials um, that had been uh, accessed. So what I found very interesting with this is, is when it when a company is uh, breached and data is lost. Now you know bad things happen. We we know I think there was a Poneman study that demonstrated that 95% uh, of all small businesses that suffer uh, a breach or loss of data will be bankrupt within five years. And so you know the consequences are very serious too. Uh, the, the loss of customer confidence, uh, the fines that you pay. I mean, you, you typically look at companies like um, uh, um, TJX that, that had DSW, and, and I think by all industry estimations, they were predicting that just the loss then at that time of about 4 million credit cards would cost them about $500 million by the time all of this added up. I don't think they actually paid that much out in the end, but, but you get the idea, it's very costly. Um, but one of the reasons these breaches cost so much money is that the company ends up having to pay for credit monitoring services. Now, uh, there's different uh, metrics on credit monitoring services, how much they cost, but usually they, they figure a breach would run either from $100 to $1,000 per individual per record that was breached depending on what's in there, and that goes for these fines. So, you know, the end result with the Equifax breach is that you've got the uh, FTC who can levy fines against them, uh, and who typically levy fines against uh, companies uh, uh, for the loss of, um, uh, or, or for violation of actually a privacy policy. You've got SEC, of course, now you're looking at insider training, trading with the stocks that these executives had dumped. And so, and you've got 47 different states that we'll talk about later that'll be lining up to find and prosecute, especially if, you know, they can demonstrate that, that due care and due diligence weren't present here. So, you know, based on even conservative industry averages, we're looking at a cost in all these fines and uh, um, fees for, you know, tens of millions of dollars by one estimate here. So the irony here though, however, is that Equifax is one of the largest uh, companies that provides monitoring services, credit monitoring services commercially. And so, you know, they are providing for this breach uh, free credit monitoring services for 12 months to all of their customers. So if they're selling this for $29.95, how much does it really cost them to provide their own service, Trusted ID Premier, for a year for free, right? And then you think, well, you know, if the people like the service, how many of these subscribers will actually renew at the end of the year, uh, will renew that subscription at the end of that period? And so if you do the math and only 1% of the victims, 1.43 million, subscribe after the initial free year, you know, you're looking at, uh, uh, total revenue coming in at that point for that year to Equifax at $514 million per year are, are exceeding the likely uh, uh, fees and fines that they would have paid. So, you know, from my perspective as a privacy person, uh, uh, you know, I, I looked at this and I, I had long talked about the fact that we are 
doing the wrong thing by trying to protect what I call pseudo secrets. These are things like my mother's maiden name, my, you know, my uh, date of birth, and, and all of these different identity attributes that are actually used to grant credit. And I feel used incorrectly to grant uh, credit. They're, they're actually used to identi identify and authenticate me to bank accounts and to my credit reports. And, and you know, we use these, we protect these uh, incorrectly because they're, it's already out, okay? So, so, you know, I used to tell students the best thing you could do is stand up a big server and everybody opt in and post all of these pseudo secrets, your mother's maiden name, your social security number, which as I'll talk about later, social security never intended for you to keep private. Um, you know, all of this stuff goes into a public server, you make it public, and um, now nobody can trust the information, right? So, you know, from my perspective, Equifax on one hand did identity management a favor by releasing all of this information so it couldn't be trusted. However, I've not seen the industry change at all in response to the loss of this information and, and the fact that all of this is out there. Um, so the other issue here is how will a federal breach notification instantly after any large breach of these this nature? You have your legislators going uh, and, and attempting to pass uh, legislation uh, for a federal breach notification bill. Um, in fact, if you look at the history of our initial uh, California breach notification bill, the first one that came on the books, it actually came about because a California legislator uh, lost his identity. And so they passed that, and that sort of became the landmark, uh, and, and everyone else followed suit after that here. But, you know, how does, what well, we'll look at it, how, will a federal breach notification bill inadvertently benefit these same data aggregators, such as Equifax, who collect this information? And, and how will it benefit them? You know, uh, um, these are these actually are the majority of the lobbyists who are behind uh, wanting a federal bill, so it takes the teeth out of the uh, 47 different state um, bills that are out there that prosecute these these violators. In fact, in in Texas, um, if you lose um, uh, medical records, um, you know you, that can even be, or you disclose medical records that can even make you subject to criminal. Uh, charges here. So at, at this at stake is what we call knowledge-based authentication, which is sort of that uh, something, uh, uh, that shared secret, if you would, something you know, something the other system knows, and, and that authenticates your identity, whether it be your mother's maiden name or your social security number or your, uh, uh, you know, boyfriend that you had in, in high school. You know, and, and this is an industry that is very uh, quiet, if you would. Uh, we don't hear much from them. They, they play uh, uh, a little bit uh, secretively. There's not a whole lot of transparency in this industry here, but it is worth billions of dollars, and Equifax is one of the largest players in this industry. So if we look at, at knowledge-based authentication, I had done actually my dissertation on this after I had participated in several <clears throat> different studies. And when, when we define knowledge-based authentication, um, the questions that are asked, uh, uh, for instance, you see VitalCheck here. Interestingly, VitalCheck uh, is a LexisNexis company. You would know this uh, as ChoicePoint. If you've been following the news, you know, 10 years ago and when ChoicePoint had that large um, breach, they got bought up by LexisNexis uh, after that breach here. But, but ChoicePoint was a spinoff of Equifax. And they pretty much they have a, had a pro ID engine here that you see when you go in to get a copy of your birth certificate that authenticates you to these applications. But they authenticate uh, individuals to much more than that. They, they are collecting data and, and they are using this data to provide to insurance companies for, um, um, you know, that your FICO scores, as an example, will factor into how much you pay for insurance, or where you live, uh, all of these, uh, uh, you know, behaviors, if you would, if there are any, um, you know, financial issues, because some studies have shown that individuals who have 
mismanage their finances, their personal finances, also tend to have more accidents. So they use that to uh, also justify an increase in in insurance rates. But but these companies are doing this back end identity authentication, providing this information to the government and to commercial entities uh, and to citizens for the birth certificates that you see here. And so. Basically, to authenticate you to what we call breeder docs, which are documents that allow you to get other identity documents like your birth certificate, like your driver's license, like your uh, uh, even your passport, as an example here, they will ask you questions that presumably only you know. Who's your favorite teacher? What's your social security number? Your date of birth? The name of the first pet? Um, who holds your mortgage? How much did you finance your car? Uh, what's the square footage of your house and your mother's maiden name? And so, you know, here are some of the service providers, Axiom, Equifax, LexisNexis, uh, Experian here. And so, again, all of these, uh, uh, if you look at the ones in red, Social Security number, date of birth, mortgage information, these are all of the attributes that were lost in the Equifax breach. So these are out there uh, already here. So when we look at um, the, the issues with, you know, these pseudo secrets, again, Social Security never intended for Social Security numbers to be used for anything other than um, tracking your wages so that uh, they knew how much you, to pay you for retirement. Of course, there's a relationship between Social Security and IRS where they exchange this information, so they make sure everything's correct based on, and they have wage information that's reported to the IRS for retirement purposes. So in, in any case, um, none of this information that we saw on that previous page was designed to be kept private. And um, you know what, what we see is that 16% of these questions can be found on social media sites. Uh, your, you know, boyfriend's name, where were you born, your mother's maiden name, uh, all of that are things that we, we share with friends and we, we tend to share very publicly. Um, one of the, <laughs> I, I, I attended a conference one time and Jerry Archer, who at the time was the head of First Data, um, First Data collects Visa, MasterCard data, and of course all that data is sold as well. But it was interesting to me because he walked up and down the aisle bemoaning the fact that um, citizens were misusing these, this personal information. We were telling everybody and our brother all of this information, and, and banks are having a hard time now authenticating. I thought, really? Uh, but anyway, so guessable. You know, a lot of this is just plain guessable. 17% is guessable by acquaintances. 13% uh, could be guessed within five minutes. Uh, Social Security has a principle that they always consider. I've done a number of studies for Social Security. Um, and it's called the estranged spouse issue in that who is the person who has the most amount of information that you want, you know, to, to <laughs> that, that you least want in your financial affairs. And that would be your divorced spouse, your estranged spouse. So. Um, the other one, discoverable, um, and I find that a lot of individuals really don't understand or, or are not aware of the number of these attributes that are completely uh, available um, in public records. Now, we're not only talking about public records online, but we're talking about the availability of public records at courthouses. And so many of these, well, not many, all of these aggregators employ what they call scribes. And these scribes actually physically visit these courthouses and they populate their databases from public records. Uh, and then they purchase uh, from private entities. And so the information that they purchase, your warranty records. I, I always recommend that folks never fill in warranties because the warranties are, are sold. They, they turn around and sell these. In fact, when they surveyed companies and asked companies what their um, uh, number one asset was that they had, they turn around and they'll, they'll say, your data. And so your warranty records that you send in is an asset to uh, a, a company like, um, you know, electronics company, because they can turn around, they make money from selling that to a data aggregator. Your utility records are sold to data aggregators. Um, 
you have uh, shopper loyalty cards uh, when you go in. And, and, you know, this is one reason why with the shopper loyalty card, I never provide real information. Uh, they don't really need to have my information on a shopper loyalty card. And what they do is they, they use the information, much like you see within Facebook and all of these others, on what you're buying, when you're buying it. Um, and they turn around and, and that is sold also. And in particular, the security questions. People don't realize that the security questions that you use to authenticate to a website, you know, what's your uh, dog's name, what's your cat's name, uh, boyfriend in high school, girlfriend in high school, those questions are actually sold. There's a huge um, consortium of commercial entities that aggregate this information and build a profile, and that is, that is included in your profile. So I always make it a, a point to um, lie about all of that, um, but you, of course, have to write that down. We'll talk about some of that in the recommendations here. Um, the other problem is that, you know, uh, uh, most of these are, are already hacked. I mean, you look at Yahoo. They had a breach in 2013 that wasn't revealed until 2016, they lost more than a billion, hard to fathom, a billion user accounts, including security questions uh, and answers here. And then you see in 2015, hackers even accessed uh, the IRS's uh, application here, and it used knowledge-based authentication, and were able to use information from a, you know these other sources to download income tax returns and file fraudulent returns. You know, knowledge-based authentication is so vulnerable that NIST does not even allow it to be used uh, as an authentication protocol with federal agencies any longer. But unfortunately, this is still used to authenticate identity to online applications for credit. What some of our most sensitive uh, uh, um, data or, or, or sensitive applications uh, uh, to be able to purchase a car, purchase a house, you know, and so what they've done in essence, these data aggregators, they, they commoditize these pseudo secrets. Uh, and until, you know, that is resolved, we're going to continue to have uh, uh, some of these, uh, we're going to have identity theft. So um, 2008, I analyzed 6,598 records here. Um, that contained identity attributes. And, and my goal was to determine how many of these attributes, what was the frequency with which they could be found in online public records. I calculated a discoverability index. I went back and I looked at the, the dissertation. I thought, oh my gosh, I, I actually did a very good job with all of that. I don't know that I could do all that today. But um, what was interesting about this couple findings here and that you know property records yielded the largest amount of the identity attributes that were used for authenticating you to, to services, the financial services and all, followed by arrest records. Um, the arrest records were interesting because they included physical attributes as well as, um, um, they included physical attributes as well as, uh, you know, your eye color, hair color, uh, and everything, and photo, um, photos even here. Now, granted, you could say, well, you know, uh, uh, they're criminals, but they weren't. They were arrested, but then they were found innocent, but that arrest record was still a part of this public record that was posted online here. And so the end result of this is that um, I was able to correlate, I was able to confirm a moderate um, correlation between the Federal Trade uh, uh, commissions reported ID theft rates and the states that were publishing the largest amounts of um, um, the largest amount of uh, these identity attributes. And so you see a, uh, a chart here, the, you know, which were the most identical, uh, which attributes were the ones you could find the most out on these online public records and, and obviously name, home address, but date of birth. Uh, which we use a lot uh, here. Well, it's interesting. What I found is that different states. Well, we'll, we'll I'll hit that up when I get to that slide here. But date of birth. If you go down here, you see that the uh, even the driver's license number in some of these states published 
uh, driver's license numbers. Now, Social Security numbers, interestingly enough, are the holy grail for many of these data aggregators, um, with them oftentimes presenting that they have larger amounts of, of Social Security numbers than what they really do. Um, but in certain states, so for instance, uh, uh, if you, you know, live in Florida, you might as well just send your neighbors a postcard in the mail with all of your personally identifiable information on it because um, they're, they're online records tend to be quite rich with identity attributes and, and even to the point where social security numbers are published. Uh, if uh, you have a um, home business as an example and you're using that as your report, uh, your reporting ID and you, you ever get into trouble and, and that information becomes part of a public record. So let me ask you something here and I can't see your results here, but think, think about this. I, I always ask my students this, if I posted a file of social security numbers on my website, let's say 10, 20,000 social security numbers, valid social security numbers, have I committed a crime and, and have I done anything to contribute to identity theft? Most people will say yes, but the answer is actually no, because we have to understand that in isolation, these identity attributes are relatively useless. Having a list of just dates of birth does us nothing because we don't know to whom they, they apply. Same thing with social security numbers. It, it has to uniquely identify an individual. And so here we get into this problem of identity uh, data aggregation. And over a decade ago, Daniel Solov, who was I think at that time a a professor at George Washington University described a problem with data aggregation where he said, you know, in isolation, a piece of information isn't invasive. But when you amass, you can very quickly form a, a digital dossier on the victim here. And in doing this in my own studies, I've compiled dossiers on, on uh, test targets and uh, have been able to, within 10 minutes, you know, build uh, a picture of an individual that tells me how much money they make, uh, what their hobbies are, um, you know, all of these. And especially, remember, this is back a decade ago before the prevalence of uh, um, as many social in, uh, social media sites as what we have. Uh, LaTanya uh, Sweeney was a researcher. I think she was with Michigan, University of Michigan or Minnesota. I can't remember. It's one of those M states up in a cold area. But she did a really interesting study about this time here, about uh, the problem with aggregation. And in her study, she addressed medical uh, information. I should first say that she had left the university. She then went on to become the chief technology officer for the Federal Trade Commission, and now I think she's on a residency with, with Harvard. But she identified that in these studies, these medical studies where they say, oh no, you know, uh, nobody will ever know that you're participating in this Viagra study. Um, she actually found that because of the ease with which you can aggregate identity attributes across the internet, that if you knew only a person's zip code, their date of birth, and their gender, that there was an 87% chance that you could correctly identify that person. So it doesn't take many of these identity attributes to identify who we're talking about here. And in fact, when I did my study here, I, as I mentioned, I found a moderate correlation to the amount of identity attributes that were being published in online public records to state reported identity theft rates here. Interestingly enough, uh, according to the FTC here uh, today, this is 2017, um, Tax-related fraud, you know, this information is used to uh, fraudulently um, get tax uh, return information here or, or tax returns, um, but then followed by credit card fraud, opening up new credit card, people who trash their credit needing phone or utilities so they steal identities. I'd also seen a report that medical uh, um, identity theft was becoming incre increasingly more common as people were having difficulty getting medical insurance. And so they were stealing identities in order to use that identity for uh, medical coverage here. 
so you know my study as i mentioned had these these had this correlation what i found very interesting with the information that i studied in 2008 to a decade later here almost is that 10 out of the 15 states that had the highest identity theft rate are, are, are still today the same states that have the highest identity theft rates out of these 15 here. You see them over in red here. And again, you know, like I said, if you live in Florida, just go ahead and send a postcard to your neighbor because they have all your information anyway. Now, I will caveat this and say that, you know, they've mentioned that we have a 3% uh, drop, however, you're talking a drop from 3.1 million to 3.0 million uh, in identity theft complaints overall here. So, you know, typically, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because a lot of folks that are attending this are, are probably security folks with security professors. Uh, however, this is Security Awareness Month, so I hope that we have some others uh, online here. But I would ask you, how privacy savvy are you? Typically, a, an exercise I walk my students through here. And I ask them, do you provide real information when you're filling out those shopper loyalty cards, like at Food Lion or Safeway or places? And if so, why? Because the only purpose for that is, is to sell that information and to track what it is you're buying, what, what time of day for product placement. Do you provide your real social security number when you go to your doctor's office? And is it required to do so? Bear in mind that there are only really two legal requirements to provide a social security number, and that is for, you know, social security number, social security administration to track wages as well as, uh, um, you know, for any type of financial transaction that may result in, in some form being sent to to the IRS for such a tuition in college, okay, uh, where they issue a 1098T uh, to you at the end of the year, so you're accurately reporting. You don't need to provide an accurate Social Security number at your doctor's office, and in fact, you know, typically what I do is, is uh, um, screw it up on, on my form. Gee, you know, I'm empty-headed blonde and I just uh, can't get those last uh, digits right. But in any case, do you provide your kids real social security numbers at their school? Is it required? Again, for college perhaps, but um, there is no legal requirement for a social security number. In fact, I told uh, my schools for my kids that they could just put down, you know, 999999999. Um, the other problem though we see is that do you answer authentication questions truthfully at websites uh, so that you can recover a lost password? You know, this is, uh, um, again, we have to recognize that this information, it, it was like double click was years ago. This information is aggregated and exchanged and sold among all of these um, businesses here. Um, the accuracy of the information they address it. Um, you know what, I have to look at the, and thank you, I just noticed I can see these questions when they post. I have to look at what is the risk to me, as a person who deals with risk management, um, the effectiveness of being able to secure this information, as well as the fact that many of these healthcare organizations will share information outside of what are uh, HIPAA entities, and and um, even certain medical information can be shared. There, there is no valid reason for a doctor's office to ask for a social security number, except that they want to use it in the event that you don't pay your bill so that then they can go and report you to a credit reporting bureau. So no, I, I don't feel an ethical obligation to give them my correct social security number, uh, especially when I have, um, you know, I, doctor's offices next to attorney's offices are probably the least technically savvy in knowing how to protect uh, these private records here, which is a whole other issue with electronic health records. But um, the other thing here, do you use any free online services like Gmail or Facebook? We're gonna, I'm going to show you a couple of, of privacy policies and, and issues about that here. And then I always ask my students, which is safer, shopping online or eating out in a restaurant paying with your credit card? And, and you know, we can talk about shopping online. I remember when with the advent of e-commerce, you know, it, people were understandably nervous about sending credit card information over over the wire here, but you're 
you know, equally at risk of, of um, handing that credit card to a waitress when she disappears off into a back room or, you know, she has a $13 uh, uh, swiper, a magnetic uh, stripe uh, reader. And or doesn't even have to do that. She'll just write the card number down here. So you know, it's always a. I always tell my students it's a risk-based exercise. So stuff I found interesting here from Google. Um, to set the stage with this, they found out that Google uh, for Gmail users was actually keyword indexing every single email. Okay, and then they were turning around and selling that information to their um, they were turning around selling that information to their uh, uh, partners. And it was interesting to me because this way, you know, if, for instance, you sent uh, a, uh, an email out to a friend that said, hey, I'm going on vacation here to Vermont to go skiing, well, then you might just start noticing uh, advertisements for ski equipment or ski clothing uh, at that point in uh, when you're going into Google or into other of these huge massive partner exchanges. We've seen in Facebook and Google where you will look something up in Google and then you see ads in Facebook and vice versa. And so Congress and, and all had asked them, how do you justify, how do you justify doing this with, you know, subscriber information? They're, these people are sending emails, they think it's private, how do you justify this? And, and they responded with this, you know, all users of email must necessarily expect that their emails will be subject to automated processing. And, and you know, just as a sender of a letter to a business can't be surprised if their recipient's assist, uh, assistant opens the letter, people who use web-based email today can't be surprised if your emails are processed by the recipient's email provider in the course of delivery. And this is the kicker. Indeed, a person has no legitimate expectation of privacy in information he voluntarily turns over to a third party. And don't be, you know, don't be happy that you're not a Google subscriber because you don't have to be. You can be sending email to a Gmail user and, and it's still going to get keyword um, indexed. Facebook, um, just as bad. Uh, I always have to laugh because you see, and you don't see as much of it, thank heavens, anymore, but you see these, uh, you know, comments going around, you know, just tell Facebook, you don't own my information. This is my uh, information. No, you don't tell Facebook anything. You, you certainly sign an agreement when you sign up with Facebook. And this is what you signed here. Their terms of use specify that, yes, they acknowledge you as the owner of the content that you post. However, you grant them a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, worldwide license to use all IP content that you post, not just what you post publicly, all IP content that you post uh, on or in connection with Facebook here. And indeed, in both of these court, you know, cases and other cases, U.S. courts have confirmed that if your data is voluntarily shared with another, it can be posted publicly. This is even applied to individuals who had posted negative comments about their boss privately in Facebook, you know, putting it maybe to close friends only, but hadn't quite screened their close friends well enough, and a close friend sent it off to their boss, and the boss fired them, and a judge ruled, well, that's, you've got to expect stuff like that will happen when you post it. So it's important also that people understand that even privatized information on Facebook is collected, sold by Facebook to their business partners, as well as to federal agencies. Privacy gets you nothing except not, in, except not allowing you know, the world to, to see it until they pay Facebook for it. So who collects your, your PII, okay? And, and so it was interesting to me that when a survey was done, I apologize because I don't have the data on this and on, uh, um, uh, which survey this was here, and I should because obviously, you know, I'm an academic, I should have that. But it was interesting to me that the majority of companies surveyed stated that your data was their most valuable asset. And, and you, you realize this when you look at the fact that, you know, in, in 2010, um, you know, you, you see that, uh, you know, actually, oh, and I spelled that wrong, sorry about that. Um, now, 
you know, they have more, or at that time, 2010, had 32 billion data records. And in fact, they have well over, what, 25,000 computer servers collecting, analyzing, uh, uh, collating all of this. Uh, their 2017 sales I looked up were $880 million in uh, data. Um, banks have a treasure trove of information about their customers. You know, your mortgage application tells them uh, how much you earn, how much your house is worth, precisely where you live. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, the um, Graham Leach Bliley Act that put uh, identity and privacy safeguards in place here um, have exceptions to this. They, they prohibit financial institutions from disclosing non-public personal information to non-affiliated third parties, uh, uh, and, and they have to provide you with an opt-out requirement. Now, uh, you know, United States differs considerably from Europe. Your, United States have opt-out requirements. Europe have opt-in requirements, meaning that uh, in Europe, in order to put a cookie on someone's system, you have to have their ex express permission. That's not the case with the United States, and because uh, we have deemed that it is economically advantageous to allow our businesses to collect this information. And so with VOBA and banks, um, they will send you once a year a notice that says, you know, well, we're going to share your information with our partners. Uh, let us know if you don't want us to do that. What they don't tell you is that they have huge partner agreements and, and affiliations. Um, everybody under the sun is, is a partner. I was talking about this to a student. He said, you know, that explained why he had a Gmail account he created, and it was only ever given to his bank. And he started just getting all kinds of spam and everything else with it. Um, you know, banks uh, um, make a lot of money from this information that they sell uh, to other uh, companies, as do retail store owners. Retail store owners sell records of who buys what when you're using credit cards. Uh, and then, of course, you know, lately uh, uh, we know with the smart TV and the ability to be able to listen to what is going on in the environment. Uh, same thing with Hello Barbie. We've seen certain toys that have tried to exploit this as well. Smartphone location data from, from cell phones that sold uh, um, to companies here. Um, you know, spy chips uh, uh, that you see here. Um, I thought I had some other uh, statistics on this just to give you an idea of how much information this is here. What's interesting to me here are these 10 years ago, Levi was uh, experimenting with what were called spy chips. Now, now they're inventory tags. But you know the type of tag I'm talking about, those small little tags that go into, for instance, books you pick up at Barnes & Noble. These are typically sold uh, or, or inserted into, uh, as an example, the hem of a pair of jeans. And using passive RFID, it allows then the, these affiliates to track, well, this pair of jeans left Walmart, but was also seen at Target and at Lowe's. And it gives them an idea of, of you know, where, where do these people shop? Um, within this maybe socioeconomic range, if you would, here. But it's not a leap of, of faith to start imagining that you can also then perhaps tie that RFID tag into a credit card that was used as well and know who's going where and, and when. Um, what I found very interesting is that Flat Orb, you see a picture over here of the uh, RFID scanner, they, you know, they sell RFID inventory tags, and they advertise that you can use it to track your product as well as your staff. And of course, we've seen efforts to RFID uh, uh, ship people, uh, certain states uh, uh, prevent companies from making it a requirement like California, um, New Hampshire, I think. But um, there is definitely a, a trend toward um, encouraging individuals. We saw this too with first data, paying individuals to become a uh, chip with their credit card. Um, now, can you know, we're not talking about GPS here. We're talking about uh, requiring a passive reader, very close proximity uh, to record this information. However, you get the idea of, of where this is going. And so information is collected, 
but where does where does it go here? And and, and so who purchased these services? And so well, interestingly interestingly enough, banks are not only um, sellers of this information, but they're also purchasers of this information. Twenty to forty percent of login purchases. Uh, services are purchased from data aggregators. In fact, many banks don't hold their own uh, authentication uh, engines or, or login information that's done by a third party. Um, credit card companies for the use of, of uh, awarding instant credit here. Um, of course, scammers, scammers who are purchasing this from, well, we saw this even out in Choice Point breach, one of the first breaches of this nature years ago when they inadvertently sold services to uh, uh, individuals who then stole about 100,000 identities at that time here. Uh, in fact, several years ago, uh, there was a broker named InfoUSA who sold, I think it was a list of 19,000 elderly sweepstakes uh, uh, players. And, and so um, these, these scammers actually stole over $100 million by calling these elderly individuals up, pretending to be the government, and needing bank account information to ensure that they could uh, um, uh, ensure their pill prescriptions, et cetera. And, um, you know, they, one of the lists that they turned up even stated that, you know, these people are gullible, they believe that their luck could change, et cetera. And, and so, yeah, so they purchased these services also. Um, federal government is one of the largest purchasers of uh, data, ag uh, uh, aggregated data, and part of, the, part of the reason for that is that the Privacy Act of 1974 and, and other Office of, of uh, you know, the, the President's Office, uh, their memorandums on privacy restrict the, expressly restrict the collection and aggregation and unnecessary use of citizen data. And the Government Accounting Office in one saving uh, report a number of years ago found that this is being circumvented by agencies who are now going and not collecting their own, but they were using these knowledge-based authentication services to get information, often inaccurate information, about U.S. citizens here. And so what also is very interesting is in 2013, the Senate Commerce Committee uh, reported that of, of nine data aggregator companies that they investigated, three refused to divulge their data sources, and one, Experian, refused to name who its customers were. So I mentioned about the breach notification laws, and, and you know, immediately after Equifax, there was, you know, there were senators saying, this is why we need a federal breach notification law. No, you don't. You've got 48 different state laws that have considerable teeth. In Texas, as an example, uh, uh, patient health information, okay, which is a little bit different, but patient health information, it's actually criminalized under Texas law. There was a dentist that threw out dental records into his dumpster that, that were old, and he was arrested. But these state laws often um, uh, have more teeth in them than what a federal uh, law would would have. I was unfortunately privy to a, a, a lobbyist organization that uh, after the Choice Point breach met on a, on, you know, a, a conference call, and they were discussing what to do about this. And, and so you had all of these major data aggregators, the, the, what we really found interesting was a technical uh, organization, but you had all these attorneys online, and they were, they were, their concern was that all of these other states, because this was California, and you didn't have these other states, and instantly they would they knew that there would be all of these other states that would impose restrictions, and and you had them saying we need to get up to the boys on the hill right away so that we can make sure that we preserve the economic opportunity from the flow of information. I'll never forget that, you know, and, and that's what the problem is, is that a federal breach notification law is likely not going to be, as, uh, you know, as, as hold the number of penalties that state laws uh, uh, presently do here. The only two state laws uh, that don't have, or the only two law, states that don't have a breach notification law is Alabama and South uh, Dakota here. Um, and then there are also, of course, 
you know, we have uh, HIPAA and we have other uh, privacy uh, regulate, regulators that govern certain industries. But, you know, the states and, and Federal Trade Commission, by and large, are the largest uh, privacy enforcement uh, services that, that we have in the state right now. Um, so it's all lost? Well, probably, yeah. Uh, it certainly won't get resolved until we quit commoditizing the use of these secrets that aren't really secret. Uh, to be able to grant instant credit. That actually was a finding as well from, from Bob Sullivan, MSNBC uh, correspondent. Um, and, and, and it's unlikely that even, unfortunately, even this breach from Equifax is going to impact that industry because it is just such a lucrative industry for them. Certainly, we need to look at um, changing our identity proofing standards. Um, identity is very like I said, very nebulous. What makes you you? Uh, you know, is it the color of your hair, the color of your eyes? Uh, really, when you start to try to nail down what identifies you uniquely as being you from someone else's being uh, you, um, it's not so easy to define here. And, and I really think that, you know, the, the problem that we have here is one of, of even national security, if you think about it, um, consider the problem of a long-term terrorist spell in the United States. The longer that you hold uh, identity, you can create identity out of whole, whole cloth, but the longer that you hold it, the longer that you use it, it becomes your identity, even if it was originally someone else's identity here. So after 20 years here, this has become your identity. And so now they get, you know, they go in, they, they go into federal service, they get a biometric, they take their breeder documents that, you know, they manage to acquire as well here. And now what happens is we bind this bogus, weak identity to this, what is viewed as a very strong credential, you know, to a common access card, to a PIV, and, and give them even more, you know, uh, uh, breeder docs. So interestingly enough, I will tell you that there was also a, a, government accounting office study that found that it was very easy to get a passport even with a, you know, using a, um, fraudulently, acqui fraudulently acquired uh, breeder documents like birth certificates. So, you know, the problem, the problem has to be addressed at birth. And we see, it, we see some countries doing this. India is an example, 20, you know, million people here uh, has one of the largest biometric databases of, of uh, fingerprint information and all, but um, it, 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 it's been problematic because in the past, until very, very recently, you've not been able to uh, accurately capture fingerprints or, or uh, footprints, uh, uh, this type of thing from data. In fact, I found it a little bit funny in that with India that they um, – had issues because they were taking photographs of babies, but as it turned out, all babies' faces looked the same. <laughs> it didn't do them much good here. But um, NEC, NEC, has developed a fingerprint scanner now for babies six months or older that will actually accurately identify them with 99% uh, uh, accuracy. So, so what can we do? Um, I always tell people my goal is to populate these databases with as much bogus information as I can on me, and, and so then lies, lies, and more lies. You know, I don't provide real answers to secrets that at websites. The, I keep a book, uh, you can get, you know, Barnes & Noble even have books with passwords, and yes, you know, I've been doing uh, security for a long, long time, and you always say, don't write your password down. Yes, don't write your, your business and your network passwords down anywhere, but you know what? I've got physical security controls on my, what my husband calls my, um, uh, nuclear launch code book, but I record those secrets to different websites so that if I do need to recover my password, I have a list of them at least, and and I'm not giving them, you know, I I don't have to, I don't have to recreate new accounts. I've done that as well though too. Um, you know, think about the fact of whether or not you are legally responsible for providing a social security number, knowing that that social security number is used to authenticate you to new lines of credit, okay? So think about whether or not there is a legal requirement for you to provide that when you're being asked to do so here. You don't need to provide real information when 
when applying for shopper loyalty cards. Uh, obviously, they're not very clear about the fact that they're selling it to everybody and their brother as well here. And you don't need to really submit warranty records as well. Your, you know, receipt that you, you have uh, uh, is warranty in most cases uh, for you. Now, the other thing, too, that you could do online is take a closer look at your EULAs, the End User Licensing Agreement. This is an example of one from iTunes. And you, you, as you start to go through this, you actually see the refer the monitor, the references to the tracking and monitoring that they do. And, and you may be surprised to put some of your uh, applications that you're using through a EULA analyzer here just to see the, the extent to which uh, information is being collected and exchanged. The other thing especially true with respect to this breach at Equifax is um, do not lock your credit. Uh, you know, that's a, a reactive response. Your, 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 um, you'll be, find out about it after somebody's already done an inquiry and gotten credit. It'll tell you somebody just made an inquiry. Um, it, what, what I recommend that you do is freeze your credit. And you have to do it at all three reporting bureaus. It's not as easy as what you think because you're going to be dissuaded when you get up to these credit reporting bureaus against freezing your credit. And the reason for that is that if you freeze your credit, that means that no uh, uh, existing or new creditor can come in and look at your credit uh, record. Now, obviously, if you're going out to buy a car the next week, you need to then take the freeze off and then reapply the freeze when you're done because they will not be able to pull up your credit report. But that in itself is typically an indicator to somebody who's trying to issue uh, credit to someone that there's a problem with this account when there's a freeze on this account. But again, the credit reporting bureaus don't like it when you do this because that information in those files is their revenue. So it does usually cost a fee up to 20, sometimes $30, I think is the maximum that some of these bureaus can charge here. But I think it's very important. I think it's the, in this instance, um, the only real defense that we have, uh, or at least the only uh, remediation that we have for this. And um, just see if, if there are any questions with this. Oh, wow. Timed that, that well. Um, Lewis, did or, uh, or any, did anyone have any questions? Well, the only one asked is the one you saw earlier from Don Tyson. He's asking, uh, most doctor forms ask that you sign to attest to the accuracy of the information, and he's wanting to know how you address that. Yeah, and, and that's like I said, I, I it, to me it's a risk-based decision in that I don't believe that they can ad adequately secure uh, uh, sensitive information. I really don't even like them having my, my health information, but there's no getting around that, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, let's see. I'm getting a few more here at the end. I need to open up a bigger window. There we go. Um, uh, I'm afraid, Con, Con you're going to have to submit your uh, question again because I didn't get the full question. Uh, Jeremy Hoffman uh, ask, uh, can you give any information or opinion for the new forced arbitration rules? Um, well, Equifax is, is an example of, of how they attempted to try to force arbitration for, in, oops, yeah, for individuals. Um, and, and they just took so much heat from that. That's when Senator Warner, uh, Warren came up and, and made her statement about this. Um, in, in, in that if you clicked on this to look this up and you signed up for their, their uh, services, that you were then being forced to go into arbitration and not be party to a lawsuit. You know, the reality of this is that um, there are not many cases where individuals have been able to successfully sue for the breach of, of information. At best, you're, you get a, a year's worth of credit monitoring services, you know, and, and because and part, part of the problem is the law enforcement courts, many of these uh, entities look at identity theft as being more of a victimless crime. You know, even when it's used for financial uh, credit card fraud, uh, they feel that, um, well, you know, um, you can just resolve this in paper that, you know, we don't have the resource, resources to expend for this. And so 
un unfortunately, um, I'm not certain that having the ability to sue and, and being forced to go into arbitration uh, instead is, is uh, really that much worse. So because you're, you're, like, you're, you know, you're likely to get nothing out of this Equifax breach anyway. Okay, uh, Rox asked, uh, Cyber Czar Rob Joyce spoke about the possibility of replacing social it's security numbers hours. with uh, private public keys. How do you think that could be implemented? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and let me just say that, that I, I speak to that only because I manage the, the security for a federal PKI. And you're talking, it's a very cumbersome uh, process. Because, you know, and, and it's a technically challenging process as well. Um, it has to, we always used to joke, PKI uh, stands for Public Key Infrastructure that issues these digital certificates for it to be, uh, uh, you know, that pervasive would have to be PKI, PK invisibility, really would need to be more transparent. But the other thing, too, is that it's very, very expensive. And, you know, it still uh, uh, has associated with it um, issues, the, the weak identity proofing, what good is a digital certificate claiming identity for somebody if that identity is completely bogus? And so it, it's the identity proofing aspect that is the vulnerability here. Um, I do think that we can, you know, when you look at certain things like uh, banks, as an example, uh, initially there was a push to have banks use uh, two-factor authentication, meaning that you had to have, for instance, a token as well as a, a password. And that was almost impossible for them to implement. So you saw that all of a sudden being changed to now you have a that little image that for phishing, just so that you know that you're at the bank site when you're giving up this information. So it, this is proven problematic for how consumers and, and all interact with these, and citizens interact with these sites. Uh, I don't think that we're going to see a solution with the digital certificate anytime soon. Okay. Uh, we have time for probably uh, two more questions. Uh, the first one from DS, how would you rate the password vault applications? Would you recommend using those to help with password management? Absolutely. I, it, it's certainly a better solution than to, have, than to be using the same password across multiple sites. You absolutely <laughs> do not want to do that. Um, the other, you know, thing you can do, of course, is to, uh, um, you know, keep keep your passwords written down and keep it in a book that you have secured uh, if you're working with multiple sites. But, you know, it's important if you're using a password vault to make certain that the password that you're using on that vault is either protected using multi-factor authentication or uh, by using um, uh, very strong passwords. But let me tell you, there is no very strong password, okay? Um, using password crackers and... Um, uh, using password crackers, I'll tell you, I'll answer Don's question here in a second. Using <laughs> password crackers and Elkinsoft as an example is a uh, uh, password cracker developed uh, by the Russians, um, password auditing tool, shall we say. They use the graphic processing unit on video cards and uh, the use of rainbow tables and can crack a strong password, 15 characters, upper, lowercase, alphanumeric, with special characters in the middle in only 28 minutes. So typically what I advise my uh, clients is if you have something sensitive, you don't protect it with a password. So to Don's question, yes, I have, all, have these passwords for websites all written down and my nuclear launch code book here. But you know, I've got a dog. I've got a husband that's home. You're never gonna find this at my house. Good luck, I've got 50 billion books. You know, so uh, we can have physical compensating controls uh, for some of this that make it a bit safer than trying to use the same password across multiple websites. Okay, uh, from Mido, do you think that from now to a certain time there will be changes in social security numbers after this breach? Well, you know, the change is not in the social security number. Social Security Administration never, ever wanted their numbers used as a national identifier. You know, they have fought against this for years. And, you know, um, so the problem is not in the social security number. This gets back to the problem being in how, con you know, 
uh, businesses are attempting to use these pseudo secrets uh, to, you know, find identity, link identity, track people, and it becomes a very convenient number. But it's it's the issue is not the social security number. The issue is in the fact that there has to be the realization that these are pseudo secrets. These are not secrets and should not be used to to grant credit should not be used to track credit, should not be used to store anything uh, uh, or, or provide access to anything that is of a sensitive nature. Okay. And we hope we uh, got to everybody's questions. Uh, once again, we want to thank you for joining us. There's been several questions about the availability of the meeting uh, after the meeting. So, yes, it will be available. I will tell you uh, up front there was a problem with the uh, about the first 15 minutes of the recording, uh, but we'll see if we can alleviate that for you. But yes, it will be available. And we'll also post it on our YouTube channel at a later date. So keep checking uh, the National Cyber Watch Center YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and search for National Cyber Watch Center. All of our previous web, uh, webinars and a lot of other videos are located there.